Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here today, and, and, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, yes, I, I, I think I'm not known as a shrinking violet, so anything that I do say I'm, I'm today I'm happy can, can be on the record. Um, I, I chose the, the title of uh, EU financial and economic regulation, do they put in the same direction, uh, because uh, certainly over the last 18 months, this has been something that I have been struggling with, initially from the financial regulation side and more recently from the uh, sovereign debt and, and, and economic regulation side. So um, I, I just thought I'd, I'd put together a few thoughts on this uh, and, and we can extend those or, or, or onto anything else in, in questions. Um, now, when I was first in practice as a European patent attorney, I remember I, I sent a long letter once to a US attorney saying, well, you know, there are sort of three key points in this, in this matter. Uh, and he came back with the, with the quotation that all good things came, come in threes, Gaul, witches, and the Trinity. Um, uh, and I think in Ireland you've had that over the last three, three weeks, you, or two weeks actually, you've, you've had the Queen, the British Queen, you've had the US President, I hesitate to say you've had me, but you've had, <laughs> but you, 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 you've had, you've had the econ delegation uh, at, at least, um, which did include three former uh, government ministers, so I mean, this was not a, a, an insignificant delegation to, to be here on a, on a fact-finding mission, which we've done, and we've spoken to just about everybody and anybody involved in the uh, sort of economic uh, situation. I think it's fair to say that overall we, we are impressed with the openness of the Irish economy, uh, and, and as I expressed it, I said because of that, I think of the three countries that are in uh, recovery programmes, uh, you're best in class. Um, and from that, it follows, therefore, that I don't think you should have uh, you know, extra special conditions put upon you. In fact, quite the contrary, you deserve a lower rather than a higher interest rate. Now, the, the fact-finding delegation was part of the background work of the committee, which is responsible for, in fact, sort of four areas. We have financial services, where, in fact, we've had strong powers of co-legislation for a long time, uh, and from time to time have been quite good in, in uh, demonstrating that and, and standing up against the, the council. The other three areas of tax, uh, competition, and economic and monetary affairs we really only were opinion givers, and that's largely still the case. We've got a little bit of an area in competition that we've discovered. And after the Lisbon Treaty, we, we found this bit that said that we had co-decision for uh, multilateral surveillance. And I remember whilst the um, you know, chair of the Fisheries Committee and the... Uh, um, Civil Liberties Committee were dancing around talking about all their new powers. I looked at this, you know, multilateral surveillance, thinking, well, I don't think I've got very much. But, of course, it, it's pretty central now to the, this, this economic governance package that, that is in, in, in front of the Parliament. But, in fact, all of these areas are working on overtime. And if, if you look at the volume of legislation we're expected to deal with, uh, through to the end of this mandate, uh, it's something like 10 times what we did in, in the last mandate. So the, the workload uh, is, is, is extraordinary. Uh, of course, the two that are extra on overload are financial services and economic governance. And of course, they come into different uh, parts of the Commission, with, with Michel Barnier and the internal market being responsible uh, for financial services, and, and Ollie Rain. Uh, in, in the sort of economic and monetary affairs uh, part, being responsible for the, the economic governance aspects. Uh, and I do wish that there was a lot more day-to-day -day interconnection between them, uh, which is perhaps uh, evident from the title of my talk, or as I perhaps put it a little bit more rudely recently, that it, it seems to be a little bit like Dr. Doolittle's Push Me, Pull You. Um, which, as we all know, is quite a difficult beast to manage. So I actually thought that it would be interesting to look at this sort of uh, push-me-pull-you problem from, from the perspective of how I've been trying to deal with it over the last uh, few months. So, so first, if we have a quick look at financial services, 
I can't go through everything. If I, I could spend 20 minutes listing what's come up. But fundamentally, we've got the G20 reform agenda saying, well, everything's got to be regulated, uh, which has come at exactly the same time that we were going to be uh, completely reviewing the original European Financial Services Action Plan because all of those pieces of legislation had review clauses in them. So, so we've got a sort of review in spades. Um, but, you know, that's no bad thing. It, it, it's all come together. If you look at the realm of banking, we've already looked at some of the issues that were left undone from pre-crisis and from the, the, the Basel II uh, round of international uh, banking capital. So we've dealt with things like large interbank exposures, which was a big issue in the crisis, and putting capital onto the trading book which means that if you've got lots of you know, risky and dodgy stuff, you've now got to hold more capital against it. These are two measures that uh, it was known were left undone, and they would have been extremely helpful if they'd been in place before the crisis. They wouldn't have stopped it, but they certainly might have uh, made it uh, uh, less damaging. Uh, we've also passed, and in fact this was in, in, in the last mandate, the, the skin in the game principle uh, for uh, securitizations. This, we, these were the sort of slice and dice and sell them off to different people arrangements, which actually uh, are quite good for spreading risk. Uh, but if they're not looked into properly, and they're, and they're, which they weren't, then, then of course it, it spread the sub, subprime risk to everybody. Uh, now, now, putting that 5% retention onto the issuers, uh, and, and indeed it passes on to many others, was, was a highly political move, and it was to sort of signal that, that we were serious about stability. Unfortunately, it was done without taking due account of the different types of securitization. Um, you can sort of read my doom and gloom speeches from the last mandate on this if you really, really want, uh, but everything I said about it having a depressing effect on... Uh, recovery of the securitization market, which was very important for long-term investment where the yield is, is low, uh, has happened. And uh, the ECB and everybody else would uh, has indeed already said that, uh, and so they're forced to agree with me. Um, but but uh, still, if you, if you look at it in, in, from a parliamentary perspective, the attitude would still be gung-ho and let's have 10% retention, not five. Um, then, more recently, we've had the emergence of Basel III, um, which will be enacted through the EU in CRD IV. And, of course, it features on this morning's Financial Times to say that uh, the EU is uh, going a little bit wimpish on this, with which I think I agree. Now, in Basel III, though, a lot of emphasis was put on to not just more capital for banks, but liquidity. And so originally they came out with this proposal that all core capital should be in sovereign debt. Um, I, I was one of those that more than raised an eyebrow. I think I said it was totally stupid. Um, uh, now it has been changed so that you can hold, uh, I think it's something like 40% of that core capital in high quality corporate bonds. But overall, the arrangements are still acknowledged as having taken banks out of the game for long term investment. And this was recognised by the Commission recently when it held a consultation on project bonds. Uh, and in fact, their consultation paper says there is a drying up of project finance through banks. And they were putting forward proposals to use the EU budget and the European Investment Bank as a way essentially to front load returns on infrastructure bonds and they hoped that these bonds would be purchased by institutional investors such as insurers and pension funds. Um, well, they made the mistake of, uh, with two days notice, inviting me to speak at their conference. Uh, so, so they just had to get it as it came. And it fell to me to explain that it wasn't quite as simple as they said in their documents. I think the uh, phrase that fell from my lips was, read our financial markets regulation and weep. Um, and the reason I said that was because of the sameness of our prudential regulation across sectors. Um, and that is actually an issue that I've been berating finance ministers and central bank governors and commissioners with only the week previously at the informal ECOFIN. 
Now, now it's true, the Commission had spotted that, that Basel III removed banks from the long-term investment picture, uh, but they didn't seem to have noticed that the Solvency II Directive for Insurance created similar problems, uh, and insurance companies are already selling off equities and corporate bonds um, in order to, to get that emphasis on liquidity and move into more sovereign bonds. And coming down the track, we've got the revision of the Occupational Pensions Regulation, which for, for the UK and Ireland is controversial in many respects, but we're expecting the same kind of push on liquidity there. Uh, we've had the AIFM, the, you know, the hedge fund uh, directive, which has put uh, restrictions on quite a lot of asset managers. Um, there's, there's a lot more going on, but I, I won't take another 20 minutes. Um, in the Commission proposal, was, there was this ongoing implication that uh, insurers and others would buy things that were in this project bond wrapper, just like they used to buy securitizations within a monoline insurance wrapper. Uh, so it seemed that DG ECFIN was blissfully unaware that regulation from another part of the Commission meant that all kinds of retention and due diligence requirements meant that you couldn't just buy something because it was in a wrapper anymore. Anyway, meanwhile, I had to also explain that costs on investments piling up through regulations on derivatives, collateral posting and hedging would present uh, challenges and detract from long-term investment. Then, for good measure, I reminded them about the lack of the business model approach in accounting standards, which doesn't allow you to have different treatment for making loans and collecting interest from that required for trading in loans where you have to mark to market. And if you don't have a difference between those, again, it makes it uh, unsustainable for investors to, to hold these kinds of project bonds. Uh, there was actually quite a lot of other stuff I had to tell them about reliance on ratings when we're trying to get away from that, uh, what made them think that these bonds would be liquid anyway, uh, and anyway, they were also all correlated because they were infrastructure, and that was just the mistake that the monoline insurers made. So by the time I'd finished, there were pretty glum faces from the Commission, and actually quite relieved faces from the investors who told me afterwards that they'd been trying to explain this all morning to the Commission uh, and being met with disbelief. Um, well, I like to think I was cruel to be kind, and the Commission did seem to at least believe me, uh, and they've been chasing after me to have discussions ever since. But uh, the, the next week, um, I spoke at the Financial Stability and Integration Conference, another which was jointly organised between the ECB and the uh, Commission, and I was on a panel that included Commissioner Barnier and Mario Draghi. And um, as we'd all been together at the informal ECOFIN, I think they had a good idea of what my views were. Uh, and I was, so I was very pleased when Michel Barnier said that he was now going to look more at growth and the interaction with regulation. I, I'm sort of trebly pleased because he signed a pledge when at his competency hearing <laughs> saying that he was going to do that. So it has come about at last. Uh, but possibly also, maybe even more importantly, who knows, Mario Draghi said that uh, while he did not think we could back off from the Basel III standards, he didn't see why all sectors had to follow the same line on liquidity. So, yes, you know, it's a bit of a score for me. Um, now, of course, in the crisis, with a, there has been a recognition of the interconnection between uh, macroeconomic and microprudential. But so far, um, the legislators' focus has all been in one direction. We've sought financial stability through microprudential regulation, and we are trying to keep a watch at the macroprudential level for harmful things like asset bubbles and uh, build-up of other undesirables that we don't yet know what they might be. Um, and the European Systemic Risk Board, part of the new European supervisory architecture, is specifically charged with looking out for those kinds of activities and cumulative positions 
that might cause a new problem. And, and in new legislation, the handles are being put in, such as like the clearing and reporting of derivatives, which can feed aggregate positions into the systemic risk board. Now, all, all of these kinds of controls would possibly have had uh, uh, some restraining effect on the, you know, some things like the Irish house pricing bubble. That, that's the kind of thing that is, it, it is intended to target in the future. Now, at the same time, we're putting in place the economic governance package that keeps much closer surveillance on member states' budgetary positions, monitors their returns and whether they're going to be within the Stability and Growth Pact, and, and, and gives more tools for intervention in the future. Of course, it, it's another set of rules that will make it less likely that we fall into a hole again. Uh, it will helpfully monitor as we crawl out of the hole that we are in, but of itself it doesn't help to lift us out of the hole. So the next step is to look at, well, how do we get out of the hole and make sure that we're not still digging? Um, well, the crisis has had three phases, the financial crisis, the economic crisis, and the sovereign crisis. And I think there are three phases of the response. There's stability, integration, and growth. And two out of the three won't do. So plenty of work, as I've suggested already, has been uh, done on stability when it comes to prudential regulation. Uh, better integration is being sought through the uh, enhanced supervisory authorities, but perhaps not enough attention has been uh, placed at the fact that Europe's place in the global market uh, is going to be determined also by greater integration in other matters. And we have not properly integrated our single market, even in financial services. So we still lag in competitiveness with regard to other, other parts of the globe. And if we're not careful, some of our new regulation will bring more near monopolies and, and stifle competition instead of encouraging it. And, and also another response to the crisis has been that some are thinking, seeking ring-fencing solutions and national solutions in preference to tackling the elephant in the room, which is the lack of proper cross-border crisis management and insolvency regimes. Now, growth is what will get us out of the hole, and competitiveness, of course, plays a part of that. And it, but it will be lost if we don't get the balance of measures aimed at stability and integration correct. And the current economic and sovereign situation demonstrates that we ignore the connection at our peril. And, and of course, one of the uh, prerequisites, really, for stable growth is good long-term investment. And I think I've already hinted that we've got a few problems there. So as far as I'm concerned, the top agenda item from now on is long-term investment, both for infrastructure and other aspects of the real economy. Now, in that, I'm not saying that we have to turn away from proper financial regulation, but achieving growth and taking that into consideration is a right-now issue that has to be integrated into our regulatory deliberations. If it's done as an afterthought, or on the hoof with last-minute exemptions, to which I might cite uh, the F Financial Times again this morning, um, if, 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 it, if it's done by you know, carve-outs and opt-outs and that kind of thing, it will sow the seeds of the next round of problems. We've actually already experienced the unintended consequences of, of, of regulation. Um, I've talked about the sameness of prudential regulation over different sectors, and in particular, the concentration on sovereign debt. So let's look at that for a little bit of time. Um, the sovereign debt crisis actually makes one wonder what on earth are we doing trying to encourage holding more sovereign debt anyway. Um, there's also the serious question, well, is there actually enough of it to go round when in banks, insurance companies, clearing houses, central counterparties, and everybody else is driven towards it. I mean, Australia certainly doesn't have enough because they, 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 they don't have enough debt. And, you know, for, for your banking regulation to fall down uh, because your country doesn't have enough debt and to then have to sort of, you know, weave your way around it is one of the first things that tipped me off that, that I, I thought this wasn't entirely sensible. But... Also, with that emphasis on sovereign debt, 
it, it's likely to perpetuate erroneous assumptions, such as keeping zero risk weighting for sovereign debt which in, in banking regulations, which within a currency union just doesn't work when you can't print your own money. And also with all, all this concentration on liquidity, which it may not be all that liquid anyway in the future, what's happened to diversity? So to me, it all rather looks like a congested motorway where a single accident uh, is going to bring everything to a standstill, and then you find that the relief roads have been legislatively blocked off. And to me, that, that, that's a systemic risk and just what we're supposed to be avoiding. So returning to the fact that I did have some little victories, if I can believe uh, Michel and Mario, uh, there is some realisation dawning uh, and even the dangers of, of sameness are starting to be recognised. But it still has to materialise in, in legislation itself. Um, maybe to finish, I'll just touch on a few areas that are before us in legislation and where I've tried to nudge things along. Going back to the zero risk weighting of sovereign bonds. Now, this is something that comes from Basel. Um, the presumption is there's no nominal risk in, in a bank holding sovereign debt uh, because if the worst comes to the worst, then you go and print money. Um, that has other bad consequences. But, of course, that is not an option uh, in the in the eurozone, so so that presumption is flawed. And in in the crisis, I think that the fact that banks were able to continue to buy sovereign debt of those countries where they the bond spreads were high and they and they got a high return created a perverse incentive because they could you know go then and repo it back at the uh, ECB you know get their money back um, and and. What, what you find, you also find that the ECB is, is, has got an exposure to perhaps more of some of the things that it shouldn't have exposure to. So, so there was a problem, an exacerbating problem of our situation within the crisis. But, but I think more importantly, before the crisis, it, it also meant that there was this sort of market slumber and insensitivity to bond spreads, because the fact is bond spreads weren't as high as they should have been, and so there was no corrective discipline on sovereigns that, 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 were, were, that were spending too, too much. Now, I know this doesn't really apply to the Irish case, but it certainly applied to some other of the countries that are now in difficulties. And now, I always thought this should be corrected in CRD4, and I've been you know, plotting that for a good couple of years. Um, but more interestingly, you can use this zero risk weight as a macroeconomic tool. And although if you started fiddling around with the risk weights in the banking regulations now, it would uh, cause a lot of, of fright and be pro-cyclical, in the future, uh, it would be a good disciplinary measure that you could add on to other or instead of measures such as fines for, for, for going astray in the Stability and Growth Pact. And, and my, my judgment is that if you had that power, um, the markets would be aware of that power. And when you know Commission came forward with saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching country X, the, the market response would be quick. Or even before that, the market response would have been quicker and more gradual. And I think that they will exert discipline in a much more forceful way than, than the council is ever likely to impose on another member state through a fine. If we, if we turn now to the matter of uh, integration, as I've said, we mustn't lose our, our competitiveness. And indeed, we have to com I I increase the competitiveness of European markets in order to withstand the, the competition from the large Asian markets of the future. Now, we've, done, we've had a lot of talk about standards and the race to the bottom caused by uh, competition. And, and regulation has quite rightly introduced minimum standards. But we have to be very careful that we don't eliminate competition because that's essential to avoid complacency. It's essential to promote choice and diversity and liquidity. And we've got several pieces of legislation, both before us and coming up, where it's going to be you know, paramount, to my mind, to bear this in mind. We've got the derivatives legislation already, where I think, to be honest, we've gone a little bit astray. We've got the review of the MIFID, the Markets in uh, Financial Instruments Directive, and we've got clearing and settlement. 
And it's going to be wrong to assume that the open markets principles are going to win the day in, in these revisions without uh, very substantial fights. Um, and, and, you know, that exercises my mind in an awful lot of the amendments that I put forward uh, and, and promote. Um, it's permanently necessary to remind that the benefits of the single market have to be seen in the context of external competitiveness. It's not simply uh, an internal club. In fact, I, I tend to sort of see countries divided and people divided into two. There are those that understand the point I've just made, and we tend to call it the single market. There are those that don't understand the point I have made, and they always call it the internal market. Um, now I know that Ireland understands the point as an open economy, but as I said, not all member states do by a long way. Um, so I was quite pleased when, uh, uh, you know, a little way time before the, um, the, the pact on the, the Eurozone came, came into being, the Commission held a consultation on the revival of the single market following the report by uh, Mario Monti. Uh, and I found myself speaking at that too and wondering what to say. And I remember the looks of alarm and delight on various different faces when I said that I thought the principle of adhering to single market principles should be an integral part of the economic governance package, that it shouldn't be sort of cherry-picked little bits of competitiveness pact, which was what was on the table uh, at that time um, from, from Angela Merkel. Um, so, and I said that I would be looking for specific ways to anchor it within the legislation. So, well, actually, I'm quite pleased because since then, the, the, you know, the competitiveness part of the pact has actually blossomed into uh, act, reference, full reference to completion of the single market. Uh, I don't know that I can claim that as a victory for me, but I'm glad that that's happened. But just in case, because that's intergovernmental and they might go back on it, uh, just in case the, the uh, amendments that the committee has passed on the economic governance package have, have included a lot of mine uh, that do anchor the single market well and truly into it. Uh, I probably have, have, have taken my time now. That's just a sort of, to be honest, a toe in the water of some of the, of the issues where I'm having to tackle uh, this sort of push-me-pull-you problem. And I, I think that, that that is, in fact, the message of our times, because it's not just you know, this push-me-pull-you problem vis-a-vis -vis, uh, regulation versus growth. We actually have it when we're looking at growth itself in the, ter in the argument that you have between austerity and stimulation. And I think what it really means is that we have to uh, put a lot of lateral thinking into play uh, because that's the only way that we're ever going to learn to walk sideways. Thank you.